So just a little bit about me and the Forest Pest Outreach Program at the Morton Arboretum. Not only am I the Forest Pest Outreach Coordinator for the state, but we also have a plant health care program. And I think I really wanted to talk a little bit more about that. If Stephanie is online, a big shout out to her. Stephanie is our plant diagnostic. So there will be more resources coming for all of you. So we've already seen the impact of having somebody like Stephanie at the Arboretum working with local municipalities. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, I'm grateful for all of you for your tax dollars are hard at work for this person. I get to travel around the state and regionally and then nationally to talk a little bit about what we're doing in Illinois. So I'm super excited about that. And if you do have any resources or you need anything, let me know. I am a free resource for you. For me, this is where I started. All right. 2012. How many of you remember the 2012 drought, right? So if you had to say, you know, kind of like how did the year end as far as precipitation measurement, where, where would you think we would be? Where do you think Illinois was? Wow. Below. Below, below. Yeah, yeah, about below, right? Yeah, yeah below. Yeah, yeah. So this image of the oak tree, and we're going to come back to this because I think this is going to be the best field diagnostic tool that we have right now for some early detection. But after doing a lot of research when um, about what happened in 2012, um, I came up with actually a really interesting answer. We lost probably seven or eight, maybe nine large oaks in Daffodil Glade at the Arboretum. And why everybody's like, ah, 2012, it was the tipping point. And I was like, how can you 10 years later tell me that this tree is going to die? You know, it, it, it's shocking. But what you're starting to see is this fine twig dieback. All of this fine twig dieback, I think I have a circle around it. We had a water deficit going into, but it was 2011 that was the driver. So 2011, we had a really dry fall. It was really hot. We didn't have the precipitation. We didn't have the snowpack that we needed. We also had high heat for prolonged periods of time. These older oak trees suffer from soil compaction. The roots are in the top, you know, eight to 10 inches. And we really think that the soil compaction, the lack of air, if you will, is really starting to impact the roots uh, negatively. Two line chestnut borer. This is two line chestnut borer. This is what you start to see. You get this tiny little flagging, you know, the staghorn right up here. You get these fine twigs that pop out over the canopy or the, tree, the crown of the tree. I mean, obviously this is extensive, right? So we're looking at all this fine twig dieback and that is what we think is going to be kind of the, the field diagnostic tool. So if you've got some high value trees, you're looking at them, and you're starting to see any fine twig dieback, you really need to have that tree evaluated or watch it. Are these trees just dying? You know, to be honest with you, they're old. Yeah, they are, they're all old. Um, and especially ones in our collection. Uh, so it could be. A lot of people say oak decline, right? Kind of like, meh, throw everything, put the kitchen sink in there, and you call it oak decline. You know, I really think that what we need to do is to do more long-term monitoring. So in this program description, I talked to you a little bit of, or, you know, talks about the need for long-term monitoring. If I were talking to homeowners, it would be, you know, like, get out and take a picture of your tree in your front yard. You guys are dealing with thousands, hundreds of thousands of trees all the time, and you don't have the resource capacity. So we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Jerome Scott, if he's on online, he had sent me a couple questions and hopefully I'll be able to answer those. Um, but again, you're gonna see this image. So that fine twig dieback, I think is very important for all of us to really figure out. So invasive pests, we know that, um, you know, we know that they're expensive. For me, the interesting part about this is the difference between a borer and a sack feeder. A borer is the one that gets underneath emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, disrupts all that nutrient flow from below ground to above ground. And then we've got our sap feeders, right? So that, that pest like spotted lanternfly that 
is really, truly a heavy, heavy, heavy feeder. And it doesn't necessarily kill the plant, right, or the tree. It just weakens it to the point where it's stressed. And that's what we're seeing is all of these secondary pests. These pests are coming because of the secondary uh, stressor. But look at this. No surprise to you guys, right? So the federal government, you know, the, the, the burden for all these pests are local. And this is just is just this just means you know individuals, municipalities, you know, you name it, statewide. This number is really, really big. And I was surprised to see this. And this is a, a current uh, estimate as our production. So we're looking at that climate impacts to urban forests. You guys know this. We're looking at changing water cycles. You know, the changing in the water cycle um, is interesting because we've got drought. And then we have too much rain, right? We've got increasing periodic rain events that cause soil saturation, cause water logging. And that can be the same um, expression on the tree. We have increased winter preci precipitation, right? Sometimes and then we have decreased winter precipitation. So if we have too much, we got a heavy snowpack like a polar vortex, those temperatures, they just rip through. How many of you have seen cankers on your tree as a result of uh, the polar vortex? I mean, I see this eastern mountain ash just get ripped apart, just straight lines and just died within a year. But honestly, no one looked at the bark. No one looked at the trunk. It just had a little bit of flagging going on. Increased temperatures and drought. We know that soil compaction. We've got imperial, impermeable surfaces. And then we've got these weather events that are causing, and the weather events are not going to go away. It's in every predictive model that you see that all of the hurricanes that are coming in, you know, are causing these big, huge events. We talked about 2012. You guys remember Hurricane Isaac? Yeah. Hurricane Isaac was the one that put Illinois back in the black as far as precipitation. We were actually two inches over our average rainfall which is crazy to think about it. When you have people talk about 2012, nobody ever says. But in September, when the, the, the remnants of Isaac came up and came into Illinois, which is very unusual, it actually had a lot of precipitation with it. And what happened was that water sat there or it ran off really quickly because the soils were so dry. So again, thinking about these impacts and where these trees are in our landscape and then compounding kind of like what else could impact them? We worry about pests, we worry about temperature, we worry about precipitation, but we also need to kind of look at it in totality. And, and, and my hope is to kind of get you guys to just stand back and look at what happened last year, think about what's going on right now, and then think about potentially what may be likely a likely scenario. So this summer, we've been seeing a lot of drought. We've got nice, I would say consistent right now, Springtime precipitation, temperatures are cool. We know that we're lagging behind. We know that. But in the past four or five years, in July and August, we go into this droughty period. So six to eight weeks of, of no, no precipitation. And year over year, that's a stress. I mean, that that's what we're seeing is might be the driver for, for all of this. So again. You guys know this is a tough life for a tree. Sorry to be like a Debbie Downer right now. Wah, wah. Um, but you see this spiral a lot. So we have predisposing factors, inciting factors, contributing factors. So we've got drought, you've got, you know, potentially you've got root compaction, and then you get a fungus, and all it does is just cycle or spiral down on that tree. But you have to have everything, right? So you have to have the right host, favorable environment, the pathogen. You need to make sure you have it all three. And I've shown this picture for those of you that have been in my presentations. You know, this is just a really colorful image of a tree that's dying from the inside out, right? So we've got root rot going on. We're seeing an uptick in root rot. We've had a situation where uh, we were helping out in Glen Ellen, and I don't know if Chris is on the line. Uh, they had a number of trees that tested positive for oak wilt. And it was in an area that was highly managed. So a lot of turf, a lot of uh, compaction, a lot of public space, public use. And the results were kind of mixed. 
And to be honest with you, what happened was Stephanie and Frederick Miller and myself got together. We started talking with them and looking around and figured out that, you know, their sidewalks had been changed. So the water had been altered. And you know what, they started to do some soil testing and we had an interesting conversation to have. Very rarely do people, when they look at a tree and they see something dying or this going on, do you ever think, gosh, I'm gonna do a soil test. Why would I do a soil test when I know what's going on? But you could have trees on either side that might be affected by that underground highway. So it's important to be able to have, utilize the resources we have. Soil testing, I think is, is probably needs to move up in the lab when you're doing some uh, diagnostic. I just put this up here, not knowing kind of who was here, but looking at kind of the root boring insects, those impacts that they have, looking at viruses, we've got mites, we've got aphids. I mean, if you're a tree man, you're just sitting there like, okay, bring it on. You've got trunk boring. So our borers are the ones that do the most damage. And then we've got kind of an alterate, altered soil that we need to, to be thinking about as well. Our caterpillars can be pretty ferocious. Caterpillar populations kind of, it's a boom or bust. It just depends on what's going on in, in that uh, life cycle. So we're seeing a lot of feeding. Joe knows about feeding. I've got some pictures from the Enchanted Forest, um, uh, which was an eye-opening uh, uh, field trip, that's for sure. But, so looking at pests versus drought, so we're looking at, you know, what we see is, you know, uh, a drought stress versus a pest stress. Our native borers go after dead and dying trees. Our non-native borers go after healthy trees. So you always got to keep that in your back of your mind. And it's just, it's not necessarily absolute, but for the majority of it as well. Too much or not enough. We're seeing this. This is out, I think, in Prospect Heights, looking at this heavy saturation. This image, even though it's a little bit old, um, uh, this is not unusual. You, you start to see this in central and southern Illinois, northern Illinois, where the infrastructure within that community is not kept up. And it's really important. Any water that's sitting there, six to eight hours, and that is the tipping point for that tree. Eight hours of really saturated soil, got water on there, you've got, you've got uh, a lack of oxygen going on, you've got disturbance going on, you've got soil erosion going on. So there's a lot that's happening, and this is happening regularly. And then looking at, you know, a drought, I mean, the, the scorch, we've got no mulch here, very, very heavily manicured, seeing this a lot. We get a lot of conversations and calls going on about, um, you know, what's going on in the parks, what's going on in the golf courses. Golf courses are really under stress, probably, you know, too much applications with, you know, fertilization and not enough water. So we're starting to see kind of a continuing pattern for that. I see this a lot in some of our lower areas in Cook County. You know what, that water just comes in there and it just sits there. And what are you gonna do? I mean, it just may go down a little bit, but you know what, that soil just becomes like really globby and really clay-like. So again, another image. This I thought was very interesting. Um, I have used these, the set that's coming up. It's interesting to look, this is starting out in 1900. And this is 2014, they need to get kind of an updated set right now. But this is online. You can go and look at the Illinois State Summary. Do look. I, I think this is a really important, especially when you're talking to the public and you want to talk to them about changes or improvements. You need to talk to them about what's happening, right? So what's happening? You, in this graph, we have the number of events that are greater than two inches, right? And then you've got the five-year period. And then along here, you've got the uh, number of inches, the average number of inches. So again, these are increasing. It's a trend that we've seen really since 1990. So that's 30 years. In springtime temperatures, a little bit of variability, but for the most part in the last uh, 30 years, we're seeing an uptick in those temperature or precipitation. Warming up, we start to see this, we know this. I think people start to get a little numb when you're just like, I know it's warming up. I know one degrees, two degrees, three degrees. It's, it's, it'll be interesting to see what happens to the tree when it's warmer temperatures, that tree's going to get tricked into whether or not it's going to bloom early, whether or not it's going to, you know, miss the pollinator, what's going to happen. Are they going to get, 
you know, the, the, the right type of phenological activity that they're used to. So we know that the oaks, to be honest with you, and, and this, is a, this is an, an oak-centric conversation, but we do know that there is a little bit of a mismatch when we do have a bloom. Uh, so it's something that we're following. Increase in nighttime humidity. I've talked about this a lot. When you get an increase in nighttime humidity, all you're going to do is have pathogens that hang out. So burrow flight. Burrow flight was bad four years ago, three years ago, really bad. Not so much because that the humidity has kind of died down. That pathogen, you know, is kind of uh, at bay a little bit. But this number, this humidity, is something that I really dial into when I'm thinking about what's going to happen. You know, so are those pathogens going to be here? We have a really wet spring. Or if we have a really dry spring, those pests are going to be here. So again, just a generalization, but something for us to think about. Tree growth, we're going to talk a little bit about it. You know, it's just sensitive to water stress. We know that. Turgor pressure is, is fascinating to me. So turgor pressure is the pressure that the tree has and its ability to kind of pull up everything from below ground and then get it out to the to the stems. When this when this is disrupted by not enough water or too much water, the functionality of this tree actually starts to decline, right? Pests like spotted lanternfly take their piercing mouth part into tree of heaven. You know, lentils, you guys know what lentils, everybody knows, right? On the bark. So they take that they take their mouth part, they open it up, and based on the turgor pressure, meaning springtime, everything's flowing hot and heavy from below ground to above ground. It's just flowing, and it's just like turning on a spigot. That, that pest has been able to find that perfect tree that will actually uh, allow it to complete its life cycle. Turgor pressure, feeding pressure when the trees are healthy in the spring, right, is a big issue. When we we don't have this, all you're doing, think about it, you know what, if you've got a problem last fall, you're just taking your, your what you got in your savings from last year and you're taking it out. So this year you started a deficit. So it's as simple as that. Frederick Miller said that, you know, often using that analogy of a bank account. If water is necessary for everything, we know that, right? If we're seeing roots that, and I would love to see but you see a lot of roots sitting this low, but oftentimes they're just sitting right up here, you know, in the turf. And, and we see that because of, you know, the way our soils are, but the way the trees are planted, but having that big, huge root that low in the, in, in the soil profile is, is really a good, healthy tree because they can withstand uh, that droughty time. Um, the growth is limited, so we know that that tree starts to shut down. So think about that oak tree with the fine twig dieback. You know, it's starting to shut down. So it didn't take it one year, it didn't take it two years, but it took it about eight years for it to decline. Photosynthesis during uh, defoliation events. So think about gypsy moth. Think about how ferocious gypsy moth, those caterpillars were. They just ate everything in sight. And I have pictures of it. I still talk about it all the time. Like, what? That was insane. They ate everything. They fed on everything. They fed on everything. Hackberry, elm, multiflora, rose, that, that, and gypsy moth. And I'm going to be honest with you. We had a really big conversation about gypsy moth in the name. And I'm just going to stop for a second. Good stop for a second. I'm federally funded by APHIS, right? And so I am uh, bound to, to follow their guidance. And so the Entomological Society uh, decided that it was time to change their name, which it should. And they did a lot of research last year and they came up with spongy moth. And so you might hear people call it spongy moth. <laughs> However, APHIS has not come out with a ruling on that because they don't know what to do with the Asian gypsy moth. So, <laughs> so I had a meeting yesterday and was advised that until further notice that uh, we are working with gypsy moth, but a lot of times I'll refer to it as Lamantra dispar, just because I don't want to, you know, <laughs> confusing as it is, but. Again, that's really important. So the 2012 drought, I put this up here so that you start to see 
So the precipitation, right, that anomaly, you're looking at that Southern Illinois, East St. Louis, and then Northern Illinois. So it's basically when the drought was occurring, we were down about 16 inches in rainfall. So that's really important. That is super stressed on these trees that actually have no mulch. They have turf all the way up to the trunk. They've got impervious services all around. This is a heat island, all of this stuff. So thinking about your trees and where, they're, where they are in the landscape, and what's right next to them is very important when you're looking at the effects of drought. Oftentimes, you guys know this, all of our streets, all they do is just radiate, radiate up that, um, radiate heat. So that tree is really challenged. Here's the drought monitor. I thought this was really interesting. I mentioned this before, but I, I, Storm Isaac was the equalizer. I mean, look at this, 2012, we were in D3, D4. Look at that, one year ago, this is where there was a deficit, right? This is what some of this information can start to help you put the picture together, right? You're looking at the start of the calendar year. Look at the deficits, the zeros going on. So again, we were in you know extreme uh, drought for an extended period of time up around Cook County. You know, probably it was severe, but potentially not as severe as it was out west or western edge of the state. Yeah, and again. Spoiler alert, here's the graph that you know, demonstrates that I wasn't lying. <laughs> so it's important. I like this because one of the things that I started to do was really look at kind of the impacts uh, within the tree itself. And so looking at the root to shoot ratio and talking about the decline, looking at the stomatal conductance, so those opening and closing, that tree's breathing, the water's going out, transpiration. When the tree gets stressed, it just shuts down. Right, it just says, forget it. I'm not opening up my stomata, I'm not letting anything in. I'm going to hold on to it. And so, what happens is leaf area then starts to decline. So, thinking about drought, thinking about the, the effects, the xylem, right? All of this connectivity, all this flow that goes on here. You're looking at a decreased amount of um, wood density. So the connectivity is declining. So you're starting to see how that tree could actually start to fail. Again, talk a little bit about it. This is really crazy, this nitrogen con concentration. So I don't have a good answer. If we're in severe drought for an extended period of time, the pests hate it. If we're in moderate drought, the pests love it. Why? A little bit of drought, all of a sudden that tree just goes, I'm going to stop doing what I'm doing. I'm going to put up as much nitrogen as I possibly can. It's in the leaf and the pests go after it. They just go after it. And then all of a sudden you have a better year next year, right? So that nitrogen concentration goes down. So moderate drought actually aids the pest feeding, that feeding part of it. Severe drought doesn't. So again, crazy answer. Think about me trying to prepare for this. <laughs> I don't have a good answer here. Uh, but again, uh, looking at how the tree actually responds morphologically is, is really interesting uh, from my perspective. Because in trying to identify potentially what periods might have a heavy pest presence, I'm thinking about the trees and wondering not only about what's going on above ground, but looking at what's going on below ground. They, I think this, the leaf tuss, toughness makes me laugh, that there's a lot of documentation, uh, research papers that talk about, you know, the pests don't like a tough leaf. I'm like, well, why do you have to be so picky? <laughs> they like maples, that sugary, really super easy to digest, honeysuckles as well. Um, but leaf toughness, not so much. High tannins with the oaks, not so much. This is the, the root response. I think, again, this is important as we look at what happens you know, to that tree, um, looking at premature death, potentially. Uh, there's that threshold. I don't know what that threshold is. I, I really don't. Uh, it was hard to get to that. There's a lot of research when we talk about uh, pests and we talk about the impacts of pests on trees. It's a tremendous amount of research, a tremendous amount of money being uh, driven to the West Coast for the pine bark beetle. So a lot of the beetles that are actually impacting, you know, that, that, that pine 
community, uh, it, there's just a ton of resources, but there's not a lot on, you know, kind of our mix uh, hardwood viewer. Sign to draft us. I think this is really important. So seeing those, I think um, a couple people had asked a question of like, how do you know you got drought stress, right? So if you've got that, the first sign is that curling of the leaf, and then you have wilt. So any of that vascular wilt, you think about that, the tree is just shutting down. And then this early fall color, do you all know that? Yeah, you're starting to see the maples. I've seen that in the last two years where the maple just gets super red uh, really early in, in the, again, like in mid August. You guys, mid August, is that right? I mean, I, a little bit later, a little bit earlier? No? As soon as I start to see this, when you see the, the sign of stress and you got early fall color, that's a good indication. And then you've got the scorch on here. Every increase. In anything over 40 degrees, an increase in 20 actually doubles the amount of water loss. So that's something that I need to think about and try to turn into gallons of water loss. So trying to figure out, you know, how many gallons is that on an average size tree? But I couldn't, it's not really available. Long-term effects, we kind of talked a little bit about that decline and death susceptibility. This, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about the pests and what they do. Um, I believe that the trees, the older trees, are susceptible to stress. I think honey locusts, honey locusts just got hammered a couple of years ago. Nothing but hypoxylum canker, or, um, and, and, and it's challenging. They're also of a very similar age class, right? So, you know, that 60, 65-year-old tree, not going to hang, hang around in the urban areas very long. Looking at crown dieback, I think that that's, you know, again, another indication. There's a lot of decline in death in this conversation. I didn't really realize. <laughs> Apologize. You know, I should put my, my headband on and we can lighten the mood up a little bit. But this is kind of what we were, the, the program is, is kind of, so to speak, focusing in on. Diminished leaf production, defoliation, smaller leaf size, too much water. So... I'm seeing this removal of drain tiles, sometimes at the Arboretum and in other ag areas where you remove the drain tiles and that hydrology is restored and that tree now is not happy. It wants to be a bald cypress and just soak up for a willow, but that tree right now is not happy. So that yellowing, that early chlorosis is very important as well. And then a new tree, right? Where's that mulch ring, that beautiful mulch ring that should be out extended? You know, this is a homeowner. So if you're talking to homeowners and you're starting to see this, you know, potentially it just is water stress, you know, not necessarily the planting, although I would do a soil test on that. The role of insects, I thought this was very interesting. If you look at this graph, we're talking about how stress dominates. So the magnitude of stress is size specific sometimes like EAB, emerald ash borer doesn't like those really small, tiny young trees. It likes a certain size class, so it's very important. And then we've got right here, sometimes stress affects some trees of all sizes, right? So maybe it just wants to go after a certain, like just maple. Sometimes we've got mixed, they can go after selective trees that are stressed, again, like if a tree is stressed, that pest knows it. It sends out a pheromone and it's an attractant to that tree. And then you've got host selections, right? So insects, they kill the trees given a size regardless of the stress. So this is a really, really kind of uh, oversimplified model of the role of insects when they're looking at host selection. You guys know what herbicide damage looks like versus host damage, right? So herbicide drift, all the trees would be impacted in an area, you know, host specific, probably just one or two trees within that area. And typically those are non-native. It's kind of fun to have this big screen. Be like Vanna White. <laughs> um, we're gonna talk a little bit about defoliators. We're kind of moving through this. We probably won't take up the full, uh, 
uh, two hours, but Lamantria Dispar, right? Gypsy Moss, Benji Moss. Uh, we're seeing a little uptick in populations. We certainly did this past year. I mean, that was crazy. That was absolutely crazy. South side of Chicago, um, University of Chicago, the main boulevard going through the campus. I went out to do a, a presentation, kind of a field presentation, kind of do a walk and talk on insects and diseases. I step out, it's the first time, you know, we're out in public, you know, nobody's, you know, everybody's really looking forward to being together. And I turn around and I'm like, whoa. I mean, it was as if somebody set the stage. There were egg masses, the mantra and disbar, egg masses everywhere. Every single tree. And Jerome, if he's on, he knows, he knows that. So Jerome and I have talked about this. But I was amazed at the population. And I was amazed at kind of the generality of where these egg masses are. So you had you know, kind of like short flower, flower and crab trees. And then you had, you know, hack, I don't know if they're hackberries, but you had just different, different trees. And some of the egg masses were pretty low, which I thought was very interesting as well. But we're starting to see hot pockets in Illinois, right? We know that we're going to hold the line kind of about 50 miles outside of Cook County. You know, that line kind of from the northeast all the way down, um, probably like right around Star Rock, Union, Illinois. That's kind of a line that we have in the treatments. Um, we know that I think, oh, I think Park Ridge is going to have a treatment. Yeah. 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 yeah good for you. Uh huh. Scott just mentioned it yeah. at a meeting yesterday. Sorry, I'm looking at. As soon as he gives a thumbs up, we'll, we'll be doing. So. Well, you can circle back to him because he announced it at a meeting yesterday. He was like, "Yeah, yeah they're going to do it." So good, that's good. I think Oak Park is doing a trunk injection because they have very small localized areas uh, of concern. So not seeing as many treatments this year, uh, which is good. That means it's. You know, hopefully on the down cycle, Michigan got hammered, absolutely hammered this year or last year with um, with uh, defoliation. Don't ever don't move firewood. Whatever you do, don't move firewood. Y'all know that that's my mantra. If you're going to do one thing, take one thing away from this presentation is not moving firewood, especially when you're coming into an area that's super uh, heavily infested with gypsy moth or or um, this moth. Um, so again, that's another word. I took this picture. Look at that. Hard not to think that that's cute, but it's devastating. Look at all that chewing. I know. I know. I know. You know, as I think COVID just, you know, made me focus in on like, oh, it's getting a really good picture. Uh, but uh, no, five pairs of blue dots, and six pairs of red dots. This is a ferocious defoliator. Will it kill the tree? No, right? So the nitrogen increases. This pest is super happy because it needs whatever that leaf is giving to. Doesn't kill the tree. I believe that repeated defoliation weakens the tree. Others think that probably not so much, but I would say it does. You know, if you're robbing, you know, the tree out of all that savings and they're not able to send that nutrient down below so that it can overwinter, you know, it's really stressed. It's tough for that tree to start making up those losses. Regrowth in the summer. I, I, I think that happens. And I was at first very skeptical, um, but it does come back, although not all of it. Um, but um, certainly in the tree starts to leaf out, the leaf area isn't as large. Looking at heavy defoliation, look at that. They're just happy hanging out in the crowd. This was the. Um, this was just an image. This is kind of where the front stops. So you start to see the understory, the green in the back of the picture. Obviously, you see just a completely gnawed off uh, plant. But it was amazing to see and to be able to hear where that that edge was on the property. So hopefully, with the treatment this year, it'll be great. Do you know what you're getting? What kind of treatment? Okay. Okay. Good. 
we're seeing the effects of like uh, BTK application, and then next year, the following year, just a follow up with a mating disruption. See, I, I don't know what kind of effect it's going to have, but from what I understand, the forces are in that area. Um, so I know that the egg masses are typically higher up in the tree, uh -huh. but they have some impact on a lower level. Did, it, did, it, did they burn this? They were supposed to burn it last week, but uh, it was the day that we got all that rain. Interesting. So I, I haven't seen it burn yet. But. Okay, that's interesting. Well, it'll be a spot for us to check out, really. You know, why not? Let's check out and figure out what burning actually does to a site like this and, and looking at that population. I think it'll be interesting. Uh, we didn't do enough probably reconnaissance to look at the percentage of dead egg masses versus live. And, and there's a couple other questions about that, but that's okay. Um, it's just important when you start to see this or you see egg masses, I'm a firm believer in getting rid of those egg masses. And if you get rid of those egg masses, when you're taking them down off the tree, you're putting them in a bag and you're getting them off the site. You're not letting them fall down to the ground. We wanna make sure that we're very specific about that. But this is, you know, from my perspective, this is a really uh, unusual event. I mean, this was the population obviously has built up uh, in and around that area. It's expanding into residential. So that's a little bit of a challenge as well. Um, talking about uh, Entomophaga myamaya, the natural occurring the biocontrol. So the fungus that uh, predates on the larva. When you have droughty times, that fungus doesn't, you know, that it doesn't take hold. And so we're going to be kind of thinking about, now you mentioned burning, I'm like, eh, not so sure that the fungus is going to be able to hang around when we're doing burns. But we are talking about whether or not it, it, it whether or not we should be testing whether or not we have the fungus here. It's a naturally occurring, good biocontrol, may, maybe keeps, you know, lower populations down. So trying to figure out whether or not the spring, really, really wet springs year over year will help, you know, kind of get that spread going. Uh, we did have a significant amount of it last year, or not last year, probably maybe eight, 10 years ago, uh, but John Lowe, I think has mentioned, not sure whether or not it still is persistent. This is what I was talking about with the canopy. This is where I was talking about with the canopy defoliation. Surprisingly, I think if we went back and probably looked at those, those probably would be maples. I don't know if you remember, but yeah, the they don't seem to like maples, which is interesting. But looking at that open canopy is typically what we would see at, at, on any website. If you're talking about you know defoliation due to Lamantria dispar, you're oftentimes just seeing that image, and it was surprising to see it actually uh, on the site. You know, before you move on from that, if you don't mind, um, everything did, you know, relief back out, push out another flush later, but everything on the understory didn't obviously come back. Okay. Like, I mean, it did to some extent, but obviously the geology is different on those smaller understory plants in a tree, so it doesn't have the ability to do it. But walking back in there later in the summer, there was, it was still like pretty, pretty open. Pretty open. Okay, good. Did you happen to notice the leaf size? No, I know. I get bombarded with these questions all the time. They're like, did you happen to notice a leaf size? Theoretically, when that tree leaves out again, so the second growth would be small. And I'm just wondering kind of, you know, how much of that 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 opening actually ended up closing in or was it just more dapple? So oftentimes, you know, they get a relief, that's good in the secondary. So Frederick Miller would say, that's exactly what the trees are made to do. This will happen. That repeat process year over year over year is stress to these trees. And, and, I, and I, I will, that's where I, I figure out that it's better in my estimation to get rid of these really hot spots so that it doesn't continue to get out into the, the homeowner's landscape. And that's what it's doing right now. And the people that were trapping those gypsy moth, they were pretty aggressive. <laughs> And there are some big, beautiful old oaks, that's for sure. So they definitely need to be protected. But uh, kind of move into a, a sap feeder. Sap feeder, I don't know how many of you have seen this. Gypsy, uh, gypsy, spotted lanternfly. Spotted lanternfly. 
So Asian longhorn beetle keeps me up at night. Spotted lanternfly keeps me up at night. It's not if, it's probably when. Uh, spotted lanternfly is out on the west coast, on the east coast, and it's moving west. So it's something that we need to be aware of. Very tropical looking. Consider that to be kind of my sexy bug, if you will. I think it's been like two years and I have not been able to hand out any of my headbands. Yes. <laughs> but, <laughs> like, lucky you guys, I go. And the mask. Sorry, everybody online, you'll get one when I see you. Um, yeah, I know, I know. Fun for me, I'm like, yay. Um, so, these sap feeders, um, population came in 2014. We've been talking about spotted manterfly for a long time. And really, truly, I don't want anybody to just kind of not pay attention to it because we have been talking about it. Because what we've done over the last two years is demonstrate that Illinois is a suitable host for spotted lantern fly. We have tree of heaven everywhere. And we've documented it. And we're going to talk a little bit about that documentation process and kind of the effect of it. But Spotted lander by the generalist. Oh. I get to hand out things too. <laughs> Lots of you guys that are in person. <laughs> this is the life cycle, but yeah, they need, they need me to show everybody. Um, I'm handing out just samples of what uh, uh, spotted lantern fly looks like. And when we do get back in public uh, and back together again, I will have them so you can see them as well for those of you that are on the line. So spotted lantern fly was here. The um, Department of Agriculture, super aggressive. They were like, we're going to contain this. We are going to eradicate it. And I will be perfectly honest with you, that has changed. They are now into management. And if you, if we have an establishment of spotted lantern fly, it will fall, the onus will fall on you. It will fall on the general public. It will fall on the municipal foresters in order to get public education information out. This pest, this pest impacts people's ability to recreate, all right? So it's it, because it, the congregation, because the population, they like to be together and they aggregate in one area. They love Tree of Heaven. I mentioned that piercing mouth part. You know what? What goes in, those sap feeders, when what they suck in comes out and it comes out as honeydew, comes out as sooty mold. You know, eventually that tree, it just chokes the ability for it to be able to photosynthesize and weakens the trunk as well. So this sadly has gone from, um, and if you have, if you guys want, if you haven't had the scraper cards, you can get them doing a headband. I don't want to, I know many of you probably already have them. Um, it went from being eradication to containment to management. How do we manage this in the landscape? So last year we got, man, bells and whistles went off. There was a positive confirmation of spotted lantern fly in Indiana, Southeast Indiana, Switzerland County came in and everybody just went, oh my gosh, these are coming in off the river. And you know what's not coming in off the river? The people that notified uh, the Tarver Bag in Indiana had mentioned that they moved from a quarantine area in Pennsylvania and they have dogs and they have dog kennels and they took their dog kennels and they moved them from Pennsylvania into Indiana put the dog kennels back on their property, left them, basically didn't move them, and they were filled with egg masses. And so that's how that got here. The house is actually surrounded by woodlands. And when they went in there, they said, oh my goodness, it is just everywhere. So again, it's very important for us to recognize that when you're going from or vacationing or traveling through a quarantine area, that you need to make sure you check the vehicles. So periodic, uh, you know, the, the, the nitrogen is an impact. So periodic stress actually improves, I mentioned this, the, the taste and the nitrogen concentration. Again, um, severe drought reduces that. Tree of heaven, here are the lenticels that I was referring to. Tree of heaven is everywhere, right? But we're starting to see it feed on walnut. Look at it. 
Look at that. Spotted fly is not a fly. It's a leaf hopper, a sap feeder. It likes to hop up into the tree, hang out there. When it gets to be about 55 degrees and warmer, it comes back down. So seeing that yellowing, that chlorosis, look at that. You would think that that's a little bit of drought stress going on in that walnut. It's not drought stress. That's heavy feeding from this pest. And there's not just one. They have multiple life stages within the growing season. So think about a tick, size of a tick, that's the first instar. And then they go from black and white to red, white, and black. And then again into the adult stage. The females, when she feeds on Tree of Heaven, the fecundity or uh, the viability, if you will, of her egg masses increase exponentially. That's why she likes Tree of Heaven. Whatever it is, the chemical compound that's within Tree of Heaven, very similar to walnut too. If you're thinking about kind of like that allelopathic uh, chemical compound mixed within both trees, um, it is really what they love to have. For some reason, if they start out and they finish their life on Tree of Heaven or walnut, it seems to increase the likelihood of those future generations. Chlorosis on walnut, I really want you guys to be thinking about this during the growing season. If you start to see something like that, please have that tree evaluated, look at it, uh, make sure you record it, make sure you don't have anything. Uh, egg masses, very similar to uh, Lamantria dispar, egg masses are oftentimes hidden. So the branches are here, the egg masses are below, they're in branch, branch crotches, any type of crevice or canker, that's where you find these egg masses. Post suitability in Illinois, we know about this. We did a quick test in 2015 to kind of say, we surveyed for it, it's not here. Look at that. Outside funder would take a look at that and go, Illinois, you don't have a problem, right? Because who cares whether or not you have like five or 40 records, so it's not a big deal. But fast forward, just like that, started to pick up, we started to get uh, trained staff and volunteers involved. And in 2022, we have over 2,000 records. So we have actually been able to document the distribution of Tree of Heaven in every single county. When you look at this and you're looking for outside funding to help, looking for outside funding to help you manage or monitor or do education and outreach, having this picture is very, very important to us. Uh, I have the um, scraper cards, but for everybody online, there you go, lanternfly at illinois.edu. Some people tried it last year and, and you get an immediate response. So if you're lonely and you wanna you know, make sure that people are checking their emails, <laughs> just send one, I'm joking. Um, but this, this actually goes to a number of people and we did have a couple of people report that they saw them. What was missing in their reports is pic pictures. So please encourage your residents if they're going to report something, take a photo of it, you see it, snap it, report it. We really want to get more information. Um, uh, we want to get, be able to get back out and see if it's really a population. Wood borers, we know him. Uh, Asian longhorn beetle, look at that mandible. Just like, oh, just like corkscrew, just, just. Absolutely, and I, many of you have already seen this. I mean, if you're seeing a branch like this and it is, you know, worked over like this, this is obviously a heavily infested uh, branch. But I want you to know that um, when you start to see exit holes during the month of August, it's always tree check month. You can take a number two pencil and stick it in there. You need to make sure that tree is evaluated and August is it, get out and look. And for gypsy, um, spotted lanternfly too. Adults are out in August. So August is a big month to get people out. And if you can, get your community residents out there, get people out there, or, you know, you guys have got, you know, newsletters are going out. Make sure that, you know, you put a note in, in August or July's uh, newsletter to get people outside looking at their trees. So this has oviposition sites where the female has actually laid her egg and then the larva hatches and they bore into the center of it, so they like to sit right in the heartwood, complete its life cycle, and then bore their way out. So again, very, very disruptive. The tree is no 
of no material value. Asian longhorn beetle is a lazy pest. It doesn't like to go anywhere. It's quite happy to just sit there year over year over year. Oftentimes it's like four to five years before you actually really know what's going on. In my own community, I was walking my neighborhood every, every, you know, every couple of days and maple, dead, one dead and dying branch. And I was like, whoa, I gotta call the guys in Lyle. Like this tree is just looks so symptomatic of Asian longhorn beetle. I looked at it, I evaluated it. It had some holes primarily from sap feeders, but knowing that perfect size, right? That perfectly round hole that you can stick a pencil into is a good diagnostic tool. It didn't have it, thankfully, uh, but it had some other more, that's for sure. But this is a very big pest, very, you know, very, does a lot of damage, lazy pest, heavy, doesn't want to move and hang out for, you know, a number of years. So when somebody calls and they've got one dead and dying branch, you know, potentially on a maple tree, I know you guys are like, man, Trisha, we can't go out and check every dead and dying branch on every tree. Uh, but do keep it at the back of your mind. Uh, and you potentially could ask a resident, hey, you know, do you see any exit holes, right? So that might help you a little bit. I, um, I, I put this up here because, you know, to be honest with you, it's, it's from Washington, D.C. It's pretty basic, but in this kind of conversation, I think it's good to just kind of step back and think through some things. So E uh, and Rathbor, right, lays their eggs, very similar, and then they start after they hatch, the larva bores into the tree layers. Asian longhorn beetle goes to the center, right? So it disrupts that heartwood, sapwood, it makes that tree branch very uh, destabilized, so it puts it at risk. But emerald ash borer is the one that got underneath and it disrupts the flow and it's right underneath the bark. And then we're looking at that really true D-shaped exit hole. And that is basically that D-shape is the size of its head as a larva and the adult. Two eyed chestnut borer is the same, same D-shape. So it's important to, to really think about that. Two-line chestnut board does the same thing, that same flow and disruption. But you can see these tiny little D-shaped exit holes. They typically like to be in the top part of the tree. And honestly, without mechanical equipment, I mean, you can get some climbers to get up in those trees to look at it, but you really should be using mechanical equipment. And it makes it very expensive and very challenging, especially if you're looking for two-line chestnut board damage. Emerald ash borer is a big deal in Southern Illinois right now. They're just devastated, their trees are dying and they don't know what to do about it. And, and to the point where if you're out walking and you're going to go to Southern Illinois, be, be aware because uh, one of the reports we got yesterday, Chris mentioned that the trees are just failing and they're, they're falling over. So it's a big hazard. So again, I kept it in here because I want us to be kind of top of mind. The other thing is, um, how many of you guys are thinking about potentially treating, well, you probably, you probably do this, some ash tree treatments, yeah? Is it picked up? It's, some people are trying to spread it out, doing more of a three-year cycle than two-year, we see that a lot more, uh -huh. but a lot more management going into really picking and choosing what you're treating and doing a lot more proactive removals. It seems like it's been more of a thing lately. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see whether or not the city of Chicago actually treats their ash tree. Yeah. Is that a quick question? In Southern Illinois, they've been seeing it coming for such a long time. And I think you have a, a very good forestry school down there that I'm sure was well aware of it. Is it just the inaction by the local municipalities? Because I'm sure the word was out. You would think that over like 10 years, there would be some, some, loop, some preparation. Uh, I'm just wondering if it just, just like the funding's not there, or just like the municipalities are just kind of like. Well, this is a really good conversation because April, April's on and she knows what's going to go on. So to, your, to, to answer your question, we've done our due diligence. Like a team of us have been down there and I've only been in this position for like six years and I was the second go around. So yeah, when it was here, 
traveled in central and southern Illinois. We did education. We provided, um, you know, a lot of resources, to be honest with you. But it's kind of like if it's not in your backyard and you don't see it dying, you're just kind of like, meh. And you're thinking about like, oh, EAVs in Cook County. I'm just going to get down to the Shawnee and, you know, firewood movement. We've done all the regulations with firewood. I mean, we've done everything you possibly could imagine. And yet, again, it is just, I think, people, you know, plant blindness, you know, pest blindness. They just don't want to see it, don't want to deal with it, if you will. I would uh, strongly applaud APHIS for their biocontrol program because they're looking at the front, like, where is EAB? We're going to try to release some parasitoids to kind of hold back. So Missouri is like, yes, fine. You know, Iowa, it's in Iowa. We know that. But, you know, they're, we're trying to really work with our neighboring states to make sure that, you know, it just isn't a, a, a fast and furious sweep. But it is in Illinois. And, you know, to honestly, it's in southern Illinois, and those trees are dying. They're big ash trees. And it's a big percentage of their canopy. And it's, it's problematic. I will tell you that the resources are extremely limited. If a tree comes down in a local community, they're waiting for it. Wind, windstorm, tornado, you name it, comes down, what do they do? They call the fire department. Fire department come get the tree, they do. But what makes me, like, we're looking at doing, you know, increase, now that the campsites are back up and stuff like that. So playgrounds and campgrounds, you know, making sure that the DNR foresters know, and they've been doing a good job, and they have been removing a lot of trees, making sure that these areas are really stable and they're minimizing the risks. But, you know, if you're walking through and it's a windy day and you got a dead ash and it's, you know, near a trail, you know, don't think that it's not going to happen. I mean, there are branches that are breaking off because it gets very dry. So again, um, we are going to be doing four programs in central and southern Illinois, and we are going to be talking about Emerald Ash for Frederick Miller, and along with Mike Brunk and a couple folks from APHIS are developing a new resource. And the resource is basically for homeowners-ish about what to do with EAB, right? And you kind of think, do we need to have this? And they, they feel that they are developing a very robust protocol. So if you have it, this is what it looks like, this is how to treat it. This is the trees you should treat. These are the trees you shouldn't treat. So anything more than 25% dieback, don't bother. Anything less than that, and it's a high value tree, go ahead and treat it. Our largest ash tree, our largest state, the big tree registry, right? Big ash tree. I mean, this thing was massive. It died. It died. It was, it was, it was sad. And they have ash yellows there too. So well, has the fire kind of passed through already, Northern Illinois? Uh Northern it's, it's it's swept through. It did. Northern it's, Illinois. It's gone already. Right. So what you have in um, in the Chicago Region Trees Initiative did the 2020 tree census. And originally 10 years ago, 13 million ash trees were expected to be, you know, gone, right? So we're looking at about six or seven million that are still left, which the city of Chicago, I think, is entertaining the idea of going in and retreating a percentage of those trees. So if they start retreating, right? What's going to happen? I mean, is that is that going to hold that population? Is the beetle pressure down enough so that you know these ash trees can handle one or two pests? You know, we're not sure. If the tree has not been treated, and they have really good documentation in their inventory, the tree hasn't been treated for five or seven or ten years. Think about the efficacy of that treatment, right? If that tree is still healthy. And you're looking at not every other year, you're looking at five years, you're looking at, you know, six years, seven years, whatever that is. There's a lot of good information to come out of something like this. But you start treating trees, you know, is that population going to build back up? We don't know. Speaking on the beetle population and the pressure and uh -huh. the efficacy of treatment, is there any research yet where, like, uh, a municipality or forest area or someone has proactively treated like a couple of years ahead of the wave and saw what that population decline was like once it hit that area? Good question. No, no, okay. not, not that I know of. Um, you know, looking because at a 
community like DeKalb who stopped treating their trees, but now they've got some beetle pressure, you know, trying to figure out what that window for treatment is. So they were proactively treating. Who was who was the one, Jim Trasalpic? They were proactively treating in Homewood, weren't they? I mean, Jim went in, I think, right? And then I know Jim, yeah. I mean, I know him, I don't know. When they started treating, I know they were treating. I know. I think that he would be certainly a, a good person. I don't know if he's, he's probably not online, but um, to, to respond to it because they were proactively treating their trees. Yeah. And then I don't know if they've stopped treating the trees and if they have, what percentage are still remaining. And then do we see any upticks? Scott Shermer from the Department of Agriculture brought it up because he said, wow, you know, I was walking around, he lives out in DeKalb, and he said, I could hear the woodpeckers just like going after the ash tree, and he knows that they're the ones that are trying to figure out, you know, point out where it is. So, yes, it has gone by. The majority of our ash is gone, but we still have about 7 million trees left. That's a lot of real estate in the city of Chicago. Do we know if I'm gonna grab one. are starting to come back in forest reserve? Yes, they are. Yeah, no, no, they do. Uh, they are, and 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 I think I mentioned it before. EAB does not like those saplings. They're like, yeah, no, we want the big guys. And so we're waiting, really, truly, to see those saplings grow into the canopy and take hold and get to be that eight, ten, twelve inches in diameter, and see see what happens. We don't know. Honestly, we really don't know. But it's a really cool research project. If anybody knows any PhD candidates or masters, <laughs> I could turn back the hands of time and go back. I would do it. There's a lot of things that that uh, I think the efficacy of treatment is very, very, very interesting. So, what is the right time interval in treating that tree? Right? Is it every other year? Is it every three years? Is it every five years? Is it seven? Depends on what you're treating it with, right? You're using triage? Are you using triage? Mostly, yeah. Yeah. Triage seems to be the, the go-to, you know, the gold Cadillac, gold star, if you will. Very, very, very effective. Frederick Miller in his research would tell you that. Um, you know, it just it remains to be seen. I think that we need to get solid information out. I'm not a huge proponent of soil drenches, and I know you know, companies are doing soil drenches, trying to, you know, don't inject it into your tree, just just put it out there Well, you get a rain and it's gone. So, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, conversations about it now. And I guess that's why I thought it was important, not that y'all need to be reminded of the life cycle, but thinking about, you know, kind of it's coming back, certainly, you know, tree care companies, municipalities, I mean, uh, you know, are you going to start treating your ash tree again? How many of you still treat ash trees? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. But again, we did. Like that, that's kind of what I was asking that question about the pressure of the population because it seems like there's a gap between yeah we know here now that two three year interval is fine but we have all you know all the trees are gone all the beetles are gone so yeah. obviously it's going to be pretty effective. But what's it really like in a fresh, you know? And, I, and, and, and uh, entomologists like Dr. Miller would tell you that EAB is not gone. So you, right, yeah, it's here. It's here. Exactly, right. but it's not yeah. like it was, you know, right. eight, 10 years ago. Where it was just, you know. And it'll be interesting to see him and the, and the protocol come out about the efficacy of treatment. You know, I think it's more four years or five years, but don't don't quote me on that one. I mean, it's just... You know, city of Chicago is going to be a perfect case. It's going to be a perfect point when you've got healthy ash trees um, and you're going back and you're starting a treatment program again. What does that look like? What what what's going to be the next chapter? Well, assume, assuming that you diversify with your plantings after the ashes are gone, you should be able to not have your tree. Yeah, it, and it, then you just you just have sporadic mortality of the rain green ash trees or ash trees and then you replace them with more diversity again that's kind of where we're at. and that's and that's what the hope is that it wouldn't be that smorgasbord if you will like a big huge buffet on a boulevard where they only have green ash right so that kind of has gone away so hopefully you know that will play out as well 
Um, but I'm fascinated with the idea of, you know, the stopping and the starting and kind of looking at what the effect has on it. Um, on the south side of Chicago, Davey's involved with us. We're working with the Monty Green Health Advocates and we're helping uh, residents who have dead ash trees on their property. There's funding associated from the Forest Service for removal. And I think that's really important. One of the things that we are uh, have mentioned uh, in several conversations is the efficacy of treating. You know, when you're talking about social justice and you're looking at 7 million trees that are broadly dispersed in and around Cook County, you need to make sure that those treatments are broadly distributed as well and looking at the health of the trees. So I think that they'll go through a prioritization process, looking at the healthiest trees, if you will, and kind of funneling in on that. But, um, but whether or not they're able to do it this year, not sure, possibly next year. So it'll be interesting. You know, um, I was just going to go back to the gypsy mom, but from what I understand, you mentioned triage is going to be like the gold standard for DNA. From what I understand, is also very effective for gypsy mom. Yeah, and, and that's a good point. You mentioned that triage is very effective for uh, Mantria this far as gypsy mom. Um, that's something new and fun and funky. And so Scott Scherr from the Department of Agriculture is talking about it. And if that works and municipalities have you know, that capability, the, the, is it the ArborJet system, right? It, that system, if it works, it works. You know, if you could do something that would help it. Um, I think uh, Oak Park is doing trunk injections. So we'll see kind of what their response is, um, you know, and what their treatment is. So, yeah, it's interesting. I don't personally kind of, we don't have that in the mix right now, but yeah, yeah. I know, good, 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 good. All right, moving on. Site infestation, you know, all through field damage. Again, I mentioned it just before. This is what, this is, is not my neighborhood, but seeing these dead branches just kind of like offshoot. Like if you're walking by and you look up and it's all green, you're like, yeah, it's okay. Well, yeah, I've got a dead branch. Maybe, maybe something hit it or something, you know, killed it or whatever. But boy, oh boy, oh boy, I've been looking at that tree in August, all right? Looking for fraps. So I'm not trying to, I think all of you probably know all of these signs, but when you're talking to homeowners and helping them out and giving them some of the tools that can potentially help you as well. So looking at any of that sap feeding that's going on in that trunk, certainly you're looking at kind of the unions right there where you're just starting to see the frass, that pencil shavings, um, really important. That's our last word. This uh, is also interesting too. I didn't know this, but if you're looking at this and you're starting to see kind of like activity here, but when you don't have a lot of larval galleries, that means that when that tree was infested, it was pretty healthy. So one that is really dead and on its way out, they're just kind of ravaging it. And you, can, you can't really see any of the underlying bark here like that. So doing a little, if you have a little bark peel off and there's only one or two um, larval galleries or chambers, you should, you know, potentially could be treating that as well. I'd say too, with the Asian longhorn beetle, I worked that for like seven years in Massachusetts and Cincinnati and that, that picture on the left with the dieback like that, I think is really important to key in on because you're going to have, if you find a new infestation, you know, it's likely going to already have been there for multiple years and like actually finding a small egg site or something in a tree is, for a trained surveyor, is really hard to do with binoculars, but if you have a new infestation, you're going to have those sea level, B level trees with 100 exit holes that are going to look like that. And on a maple, that's a really telling picture. Like even when we found woodlots that were completely infested, like the maples are always the ones, you know, and that's what they hit. Even when there's other hosts there, like those red maples and silver maples are what we're really focused in on for the heavy damage. Excellent. I'm glad you, I, I'm glad you mentioned it. Also, speaking of Asian longhorn beetle, last year, two years ago, last year maybe, um, during COVID, South Carolina. South Carolina had it, and they have it in a homeowner's association. It's about 60 miles west of the port of Charleston. And two things come to mind. When you mention that the trees, so they're going after cottonwoods, right? And, and they had big swampy area. In that swampy area, 
they've got snakes, they got alligators. You know what? It is absolutely unbelievably expensive because everything's mechanical. And now in Ohio, and I mean, they're all, they, they won't do anything without equipment, heavy equipment to get in there. And so being able to train homeowners you know, on what this looks like and watch out for it, I think is really important. I appreciate you. You're talking about it. The South Carolina man, they did a DNA on the, the pests that they found and they determined that it was the same, same as the population in Ohio. It didn't mean it came from Ohio. It just means that it didn't come from outside of the country. So it wasn't a new uh, population, but it's contained within the United States. So again, this keeps me up at night because <laughs> you think about like ash or you think about like what's left in our urban canopy, silver maple, that's everywhere. Yeah, red maple is probably not as high, but still in the home landscapes there. So again, thank you for that. Yeah, it's good. Book decline. You saw this picture in the beginning and I started to talk about it. I was deeply moved by the death of these trees. And I think, you know, it was just whether or not it was COVID and I had an opportunity to be walking by frequently, but looking at that telltale sign and really trying to, you know, get out there, take pictures of it and come back and monitor it over time. If you have high value trees, you know, if you've got trees around the municipal building, the village hall, the school, you name it, wherever it is, if you start to see this right here, take a picture of it, go back three or four times during the year and take a picture. If you start to see more decline, that is, I think, the first. Oak decline, there is a lot of what it is. And I, I, uh, it's not part of this conversation, but uh, we are seeing um, oaks that uh, are stressed and have oak wilt and have testing positive for it. And, and we have another conversation on oh, fungal pathogen. Okay, so when I mentioned oak decline, I kind of put fungal pathogens afterwards because I mentioned that in Glen Allen, um, they had a number of trees test positive for oak wilt and they had failure, right? So the trees were just failing. Was it burrow plight? We're not sure. They did a number, they did two rounds of testing and those tests came back and they were different, right? So there's two types of tests for oak wilt. I'm not going to get into that. But what happened was after they went through this analysis, in this park-like setting, they moved a sidewalk, right? How often do you guys do that? Sometimes you move a sidewalk because you got a, you got a new tree, you got drainage problems or something. Well, that created this just little bowl. And so those oak trees just sat in the bowl and they had water, they had increased precipitation. And when they went in and they did the soil testing this year, they found out that they had Phytophthora. So you immediately were only thinking about oak wilt. Like, let's just treat for oak wilt. Let's just treat for two-line chestnut borer. Let's treat for burrow flight. But the, the truth is that tree is really stressed and it's got a fungal pathogen below ground and that needs to be treated. I would highly encourage all of you, if you do see signs of oak wilt, you should have the tree an oak decline, you should have your soil tested. And it has to be done in a lab. It has to be done uh, so that you can get the right diagnosis for it. The research is really unlimited when we're talking about um, oak decline. But looking at these Phytophthora, you know, they can survive in the soil. And, and Jassy, this is more of a, a nursery picture, but um, it moves through movement. So when it's raining out, you know, the spores open up and they can move. And it's basically here when we've got, again, wet springs, you know, cool wet springs, that pathogen hangs out, it's super happy. Um, flooded and saturated soils, there's that six to eight hours, if you will. You've got Phytophthora, you've got soil that's saturated and it's just sitting there, the likelihood of it moving is significant. You don't need a wound, so it's not a pruning. Get out of your <laughs> I was going to say, is it a fire alarm? Because <laughs> that would be the hat trick. Like, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, sorry. There was a little noise out in the hallway. Okay. So, again, um, trees are stressed. You can treat Phytophthora, but you need to get that soil. I would highly recommend that we go about thinking about ways to get soil tested when you've got these trees that are failing. So, don't just think 
it's Oakwell. Don't just think it's too light chestnut floor, but look at what's going on below ground. Nine times out of 10, 80% of the problem is usually below ground, not above ground, but we always usually focus on what we see and what we can respond to. So again, this is just a, another, another reminder, you do need a lab verification, University of Illinois, uh, contact staff, if she's got some recommendations. Two line chestnut floor, I brought this up because Jim knew there's that D-shaped exit hole. I would not have talked about this three years ago. How many of you guys got problems with two line chestnut floor? Yeah, 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 where are you? Pardon? Barrington, yeah, yeah. We're losing trees faster. I'm talking residents on the ledge every day. Okay. So Wisconsin, Went up to Wisconsin three years ago, four years ago. Do you guys have a problem with COVID? You're like, I don't know, was it three years ago? Was it four years ago? I think that you know everything that happened before that is just kind of like, I need to make sure I put it on my timeline. Went up and uh, uh, did a presentation with Rainbow Tree Care Company. And they talked about treating burrow flight with, um, in addition to two-line chestnut board. I was like, what? What are you guys doing? Like, why would you do that? And I didn't really hear a lot about two-line chestnut borer. Um, talked to a couple people um, and they said, don't see it that much. And now we're starting to see it come in, you know, in the Northern part of Illinois. It really, I think, I think we need to be more aware of it. Absolutely. And it's interesting. Where in Barry? Yeah. Um, yeah, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. This, uh, I put this up there. Chris Bachtel took this picture. Love the mulch tree. That's great. Look at that. You know, I would say that trees probably got girdled or, or has a, you know, burlap spill on it, planted improperly, whatever. Upon further inspection, this is all two line chestnut board. Did it come from the nursery? Not sure. So, inspecting those trees, if you got trees that are being delivered, making sure that you do that inspection before that tree goes in the ground. This tree was just riddled with two-line chestnut borer. That shrubbiness, if you will, see how tight these leaves are to the, the trunk? This is a last-ditch effort for any type of photosynthesis. That is another sign that trees are on, on the way out. I will say that oaks are looking more like ashes right now when you start to see that bottle brush look with an oak tree. You, from a distance, if you start to see it, you're like, is that Virginia creeper or the epicormic shoots? What's going on? So another good sign for us. Oh, the poor polar vortex. Look at that. Look at that. Cracks, just straight line all the way down the trunk. I was, that, that was that way, I think, probably for two years, possibly. So the polar vortex was in 19, so 20 in the uh, August of 21. Look at that. Dead. Look at all that. Nobody knew. All the cankers are in there. Just got in there and ripped right through it. So when you've got a polar vortex and you've got these really soft, you know, bark, these trees, this is an eastern mountain ash looking for these telltale signs and unfortunately that street side and on the other side where the residents were nothing so again that 360 view of that tree uh i think is always is very important management options i think we talked a little bit about it a couple questions about what can you do um you know you all know this so we do good good cultural practice plant drought tree drought resistance trees. Um, there's going to be Michelle Catania from the Morton Arboretum is heading up a really good series on soils and soil volume and soil health. So stay tuned for that. She uh, uh, gives a good presentation. It's got a lot of good information. You know this, always tough to do. Pruning trees on a regular cycle will start to limit the stress associated with that. So getting on a regular cycle I think is, is really helpful. Don't prune during the growing season. We know that. Mulch. It's not always easy to mulch. You know, see it's expensive um, and it's tough to maintain. And if you got these big rain events and it washes away, it, you know, but 
I think the homeowner needs to help out, and if they can provide that mulch and continue to refresh that mulch during the growing season, it's really important. Again, you know, engage public support. I think the question was, what 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 can we do as municipal foresters to help the public understand what those stresses are? And I think you should help them certainly during a drought, getting a public service announcement out asking them to water the parkway trees, getting them out and looking at the trees, I think is important. Um, you can do a growth inhibitor uh, for any uh, for trees. I think um, it's kind of getting out of my wheelhouse. I had coral canker on an elm. So we treated it with a growth inhibitor and that tree is still with us, thankfully. Um, but it really slows down what's going on below ground and allows that leaf area, that tree to kind of take a couple years and, and kind of uh, replenish the, the, the bank that's down below. So monitoring our trees, I think is important. I did talk about uh, why we would do this. Mitigating tree stress, that's great. Public response, again, um, August is tree check month. This is most important to me. I just want people out looking at this. I want people out looking at their trees every day. So it's really important. And a point that um, Indiana brought up during the drought is that watering restrictions may not apply to trees. Maybe it's just turf, right? And so making sure that you have a clear understanding of whether or not in your community, if there is a, a watering restriction, what that encompasses and make sure that you clearly communicate that to your residents. So uh, potentially they're not going to be able to water their turf, but they could water their trees. Long-term monitoring. I put this out here because I thought this is really, I, I use this system. I like it a lot. It's uh, Healthy Trees, Healthy City. And it is very, very, very robust. And it is a really good tree health monitoring app. So you can use it on your phone, you can train residents, they can do block by block monitoring. I think that's very, very helpful. Um, you can manage a project on the dashboard. So you, you and your own uh, uh, profile or your own community can actually manage a project if you're going out and doing um, block by block uh, monitoring. If you're looking at whether or not there's changes to any of the water regulations, you're looking at temperature responses, you're looking at dieback and mortality. I mean, tree, Healthy Trees, Healthy City app is a lot. It's very powerful. It's a very good tool. We're using it in urban cities all across the country. Um, it's very helpful. They've got great information on best management practices for watering. I like this a lot. You can direct public to it, so it's important. We need people to be looking at the trees. I put this out here because I thought it was really important. So we know that when people get out and monitor your trees, you're increasing the likelihood of that tree's survivability, right? So stewardship, those real-time engagements. iNaturalist. iNaturalist will tell you whether or not you got a pest. That's how they found spotted lanternfly in, in New York. People were like, what's this crazy bug? And people at iNaturalist were like, wait a minute. It's now in you know downtown New York City. It was a real time of observations. People are inspired by science. Hopefully, it'll get a behavior change, learning skills. So again, just more information that you could use to engage public. Great online resources. I've mentioned EdsMap before. EdsMap has got a really good training. Uh, you might not want to use it just because it's only for invasive species, but they do have great resources. Facebook, Illinois Invasive Species Awareness and Management. How fun is this? Um, we are going to be using this uh, a little bit more as we get uh, the Illinois Invasive Species Council up and active. Plant Healthcare Report. How many of you use the Plant Healthcare Report right now? Yay! We love the Plant Healthcare Report. Yay! I've been working in plant clinic a little bit uh, over the winter to help them out, and it's been fun to hear what people are calling about. So it's, it's fun. Um, plant health care report is out right now, and so it's online. Super good, really current, useful information. So definitely check that out. Online resources. Many of you already have this, but if you want any more, 
They're right here. Uh, it is online as well. So these are invasive plants and pests. Yeah. Another Facebook shout out. If you see a report it, uh, Scott Shermer is, or the Department of Agriculture, is the first line of defense typically. Uh, if you can't, for some reason, get Scott, APHIS, Greg Rensler is our state plant health director. This is my information as well. So if you see it, take a picture of it, record it. And then just a quick update on the Illinois Invasive Species Council. We're super excited. It's back, it's reconvened, it's all taxa. Um, I'm on a subcommittee for pat, pests and pathogens. We have Illinois Invasive Species Council at gmail.com, I think. I, I don't have, I didn't have a chance to confirm that. But it's really important to know, you guys know that there's a number of people that are volunteering in order to promote the reestablishment of the Illinois Invasive Species Council. So it's very, very, very important. Uh, we're looking forward to hopefully doing some plant uh, health assessments. So looking at potentially what's going on with jumping worms, looking what's going on with calorie pair, uh, looking at those assessments. It is a recommend. Is a it's a um, uh, it's a recommending body. It's not regulatory. So it, it's just purely recommendations. My last public service announcement. <laughs> Don't move firewood. You guys know that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Hold on. I'll get back. I'll get back here. There you go. There's somebody at work that would do that for sure. Good. And then that's it. Um, I was surprised. I'm like, am I going to make it two hours? <laughs> we didn't quite get to two hours, but I think that's okay. We'll have time for questions. This is not me. I wish it was me. I wish I had that costume. That's my spotted lanternfly head uh, costume, but it's not me. If I find it, I will definitely uh, just let you know. But, yeah. Do we want to take any questions? I don't know if there are any questions. I don't know if people um, are still on. Or... Somebody did ask if you would be willing to send the slideshow presentation to April. Um, it looked like that was the only other question. I had another question. Um, it was about like the early fall color that we've been seeing. Have you noticed um, after that after that early fall fall color or maybe even possibly early leaf drop? A lot of these trees not coming back the following season or um just being stressed driving smaller leaves yeah just being stressed just smaller, being stressed yeah and i'm seeing a lot honestly in red maples yeah. for some reason just boom done i mean they they right about mid-august yeah they just they just turn red and you're like whoa ooh, ooh. It's, we, get, yeah. we get one cool night so if you get one cool night below you know 40 degrees and that tree just goes I'm shutting down. That's it. I'm giving up really soon. So yes, but we do see them come back. Yeah. Uh, seen a lot of, especially last year for sure. Really? Um, one other thing that's kind of related or not related to this. Have you noticed? I didn't. I've never noticed black knot on hawthorns. Oh, on hawthorns? Yeah. No. Has you guys noticed that? No. Not so not we like just that. had. We actually just had. We have tree planting going on right now, okay. and our forester called the nursery and said, hey, we've got 11 trees here, all hawthorns that you guys are, guys are planting and they're all loaded with black knot. So they're taking all back and I'm like, he called me and I'm like, I didn't even know, I didn't know that black knot went after. You know, I wouldn't say go after, but you know what I mean? I've never seen them on hawthorn. No. But I can recall. Yeah. Years ago. Yeah. I, thought, I thought he said it was something else, but it wasn't like black knot, it was some other kind of we saw that like five, like literally like five years ago, and I thought it was black about it. Like she knows me. The nurse really told me that it was something else. Because we ended up calling the nurse, and the nurse is like, "Oh man, it's not." It was like, "All right, so I'm assuming that it was." It looks like identical. Does it? I don't okay. know. Okay. Oh, I believe it's a cedar quince rust. Yeah. Cedar quince rust. Out on the tips. Thank you for that one. <laughs> yep, it's Lou. But uh, that's what we see a lot of on, especially on uh, Washington Hawthorns. Awesome. Okay, great. That's, that's good information there. Thank you.
That's been and out. Let's see if there's any other. Uh, there. But is there, have we seen like direct evidence to like sidewalk and street maintenance and the spread of oak wells, like for the cutting of the roots that would happen during that? Because they're not really been direct ties to that. There's not been direct ties. I mean, it's, it's pretty closely associated, but nothing specific. Now, okay. I mean, we're starting to see, well, not we're starting to see, burrow flight too is typically found when there's a lot of concrete, you know, where there's roads and things like that, where it's an edge species. We see, we've seen that, uh, but not necessarily oak wool. I will say that oak wool, the reporting of oak wool up, is on the uptick. I mean, it was here, you know, 10, 12 years ago, yeah. And then boom, now, I mean, even longer than that, but. Now we're, a lot of people are talking about um, oak wool and testing it. And that oak wool testing, that story is a good, it is a good presentation for all of you because Glen Ellen should should share their story and what they did and what they they experienced because they had two different types of tests. They tested these very high priority trees. Um, one of our uh, uh, board members lived very close to the to the site and actually ended up just doing removal and you're like oh no, don't, like, don't don't be doing that right now um so they've got a really good story we're working with them very closely so stephanie's been doing the soil testing uh we're we're gonna get out there and look at them regularly we've got volunteers that are monitoring those trees so, but it's a site that has a very natural area and then it has a manicured area, very high traffic. They moved the sidewalk, so they've altered the soil and actually altered the, um, the soil uh, moisture significantly. And we think that that's what actually ended up happening, spreading uh, the oak wool. Uh, another question, what is the best place to send photos of suspect oak trees, et cetera, and the best place to send samples? Okay, good. So University of Illinois uh, Extension, they have a plant clinic, and so there, that's a good place to send samples. I, th that's the one that we recommend. Uh, there are other ones. Does anybody else have a, have, have a different recommendation? We've been sending, uh, there were some oak wilt samples that were sent to Texas because that's, you know, they're, they're really known for kind of the testing that they do. When you're doing oak wilt samples though, you have to cut the, you, you have to take the sample. It has to be live. It has to be packaged in a protocol. It has to be shipped. Only ship it like Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Don't do it on Thursday or Friday because it'll sit and it won't be any good by the time it gets there. So there's very specific protocols for oak wilt. Um, and then borough flight, to be honest with you, um, uh, we're getting kind of some conflicting information about borough flight. So if you think you have borough flight, make sure you know it's borough flight. And that borough flight has those black pustules, has that V-shaped necrotic wedge at the tip of the, the leaf. Um, I saw some, some reports um, and photographs and some of the lab reports said it wasn't um, it wasn't Tabakia ioensis. And to be honest with you, the Forest Service came down and basically said, if you've got those black raised pustules on the petiole and you don't have to get it tested. I mean, it's, it, they're comfortable with that diagnosis as well as the, the, the leaf. So I need to follow up on, on that. But if you are concerned about your analysis from a lab, don't hesitate to go back. Don't hesitate to reach out to the plant clinic because they have a number of labs that they would recommend, right? Uh, so making sure, I think Glen Ellen could tell you that they use two different locations, two different labs, and they got differing stories, differing stories. Not on all of them, but just a little bit of a, a differing story. Uh, and, and, you know, they did their due diligence. They contacted tree care companies and folks came out and they were great and they're really trying to help them. But these are big oak trees, you know, yeah. big oak trees. Yeah, yeah. They take up a lot of space that have made, you know, this park, which is actually, you know, kind of the prized spot, if you will, um, in around Lake Ellen. Um, they also follow up now. Uh -huh. um, could you email those protocols along with the slides to April? Like, and just like, 
the protocols, protocols for sending out the samples or something oh. like that, like what you recommend, how they should do it, you know, maybe the days of the week, things like that. So write it down. Okay. Here <laughs> I'm like, I'm saying yes. I'm like, oh yeah. And I'm like, yeah. Uh, sure. I think that's the last uh, protocols for sending samples. I know that we've talked about that a lot with um Arborists and kind of where do we send the, the samples and whatnot. So let me just you want the slide deck? Yes. And it'll be a, in a PDF. Samples. Um, okay. That is all I know. If there's any other questions, if anyone has any other questions here. <laughs> it's nice. Happy Saturday. 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 Week. Uh, I know. It's the, it, and, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's kind of like, it, certainly over Zoom, you know, my enthusiasm gets tempered because of, you know, Zoom interaction. But when I'm with you guys, I'm like, oh, and this tree's dying, this tree's dying, look at that, fast. look at that, look at that. Um, you know what the hopeful news is? I think that all of us can, um, and, and we'll, are fully equipped to be able to identify a past and early detection. We are smart enough now where we would get a rapid response. And that's, that's my hopeful message that if people change their behavior, don't move firewood, right? And then think about kind of monitoring the trees. I do believe that we are getting there. I think our, we've got an engaged public. I think we've got a lot of good resources that, that are available. Chicago Region Trees Initiative is, you know, really trying to get out there and, and get closer to communities. And so for me, uh, the, the bright and shining moment is, is that hope that we will have an early detection. And it's it's not only what our conversation is here and people online, but it's when you go back to your own community, go back to your own you know, organization and you start sharing some of this news, you know, it's very important. And to know you're not alone, right? You have somebody like me who likes to wear funny costumes and headbands. <laughs> <laughs> but no, thank you. I, 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 I loved how this kind of came together. Um, I, I've been interested and I mentioned that 2012, people just hang their hat on 2012. They're like, the drought of 2012, but boy, you start reading the whole article and like digging around and you're like, oh wait, Isaac was a game changer. And knowing that, but also thinking more fully about kind of what's going on when we talk about precipitation or lack thereof in temperatures. So really trying to work to save some of these full mature trees. I love tree planting, um, but I'm more interested in keeping what we have. Okay. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. you have a question? Yeah, any indication that native birds are eating the um, spider lanterfly or some insect uh, there's a natural occurring fungus that is a, a good parasit, uh, parasitoid, if you will, for spotted lanternfly. Uh, praying mantis is actually the, the one that loves spotted lanternfly. It's crazy if you think about like praying mantis. Yeah. And this big, heavy, you're like, I just swallow that thing. A colleague of ours um, it used to, was in Asia, you know, a couple years ago, and they had spotted lanternfly everywhere. Right, they have spotted lanternfly everywhere, but the, the praying mantis keeps that population in check. They don't have a problem with spotted lanternfly. They're like, hey, it's kind of cute, it's kind of cool, but their populations don't grow. Maybe they don't have, you know, tree of heaven to the extent that we have tree of heaven, right? So, um, you know, more praying mantis. They're looking at, um, they're looking at kind of what other parasitoids might work. And there's a lot of good research that's being done through the labs out in Massachusetts. So. It doesn't look really difficult when a new exotic comes in that explodes and then I just push back and just, yeah. I can name many. Yeah, usually I have a big slide that has a, you know, you know bell curve and yeah, right. tell you, right. Yeah, I just say not to do that this today, but that's what happens because it goes unnoticed. So it goes undetected, it's here. And that's what happened really with spotted lanternfly, you know, in Indiana. I mean, they're kind of like, you know, 
it's here, what do we do with it? So, um, you know, I think that, that it's very important for us to, to get that early detection and, you know, get that mantra out, you know, and early detection will help all of us. Yeah, it is. We're just, you know, trying to make sure that like we're dealing with this. So our cooperator is always talking about side lantern fly, and we do have scraper cards if you want them. But it's not if, it's when, you know, and it's kind of hard when you're in this position to be like, when's when? <laughs> like, oh. But we are ready. We've been testing our monitoring system. So through Ed's map, uh, got a lot of national uh, and regional uh, interest in the monitoring program. So many states are interested in replicating what we're doing in Illinois, which is great. So it's, it's been a it's been a positive experience.